How do you do? A fool's wrath is presently known and leads to grief and regret. Ask the man in this story. He stood six feet four with a temper to match. He wanted to be an individualist and have his own way, a way that led to the pit of despair until his heart and mind and life were unshackled. Lifting up the name above all names, this is Unshackled, true life stories dramatized and produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Someone who is homeless can easily think, I am a stranger in the earth. No one cares. But folks at Pacific Garden Mission care. And so do the generous friends who send financial gifts to keep the doors open at the mission day and night, welcoming those without a home. What an opportunity to show mercy and kindness, to offer the bread of life to those who are perishing. Along with a safe place to sleep, the Old Lighthouse offers showers and fresh clothing and hearty meals to as many as a thousand people a day. The Mission Medical Clinic also treats resident guests. But above all, mission pastors and counselors share the gospel, the greatest news for mankind. Whoever knows him is a stranger no more. And that same message goes out to the world in 15 languages through this program. Now for broadcast around the earth. Here is program number 3361 in the series, Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. Now, who can that be so early in the morning? There's a police car out front. I hope Bozy isn't in trouble. I'll see what he wants. Mr. Lytle? Yes? Your son had an accident. I'm not surprised by the way he tore out of here. Is he all right? A train hit his car on Main Street. A train? Dear Lord. He's been taken to the hospital. Then he is alive. A paramedic was on his way to work and saw the accident. He did CPR on your son at the site. Let's go, Dale. We have to hurry. I don't know if you'll make it in time to see him alive. Life was already a train wreck for the man in our story who was just 21 years old. These are the events that led up to that moment. The true testimony of Del Rey Lytle, right now on Unshackled. I was the middle child with a sister on either side of me. My older sister called me Bozy because of the fleece pajamas I wore that had big feet like a clown to keep me warm when I was two. The name stuck, and I grew into those big feet and then some. By sixth grade, I was playing baseball in the junior baseball club where Dad was a coach. I was gifted at sports and played several positions. I was very competitive, but my temper was always a problem. Good try, good try, good try. Now, hold on, the Bosey, don't throw your bat and helmet like that. A mat. Well, that, that's poor sportsmanship. I don't care. That ball was not foul. You'll be benched if you keep that up. You have to accept the ump's decision. Every mistake set me off. If I struck out, if I got put out on base, if I made an error on the field, everyone knew it. I expected perfection and reacted badly when failure happened, stomping all the way back to the dugout. Because of my size, none of my teammates confronted me, only the coaches. Even so, I made the all-star team every year, and the teams I played for were always in the playoffs at the end of the season. Are we going to the lake this weekend? Sure. Super. I love water skiing. Then we can't go to church. Uh, we'll start going in the fall. In the fall, you go pheasant hunting in Nebraska with family. Well, God understands. Yeah, Mom, God understands. I wonder. We hardly ever go anymore. Mom and Dad were saved in their early 20s but family events had filled their Sundays. Every weekend we drove down home where Dad's family lived, so God was peripheral to my life, not even on the radar. Yet nothing satisfied me. I relied on my flesh for happiness, but always felt dissatisfied. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I would learn the answer to that question. A big field behind our house had an old railroad bridge at the end of it, 
and us neighborhood boys gathered there, calling it the 1819 Cave because that was the date engraved on the walls. <laughs> hey, Bozy, you want to try some of this stuff? It's powerful. What is it? It's marijuana. Sure. Why not? Maybe it'll mellow you out, Bozy. What's that supposed to mean? Like I said, try it. You'll like it. Sin brings pleasure for a season, and that's what marijuana was for me. Even though the pleasure didn't last, I liked the feeling the drug gave me. This led me down a very dangerous road, seeking a pleasure that lasted. But marijuana torpedoed the future. My grades were terrible. When I was 15, I quit playing baseball because I decided it wasn't for me. At 16, I worked in a restaurant. One weekend, my folks went down home, and I couldn't go because I had to work that night and the next morning. I got off work late, came home and smoked a few joints, then got the munchies and began cooking bacon, eggs, and hash browns. The fat in the skillet caught fire, and I threw some water on it. Oh, man. Never pour water on a grease fire. Flames went everywhere. I couldn't get the fire out, so I ran, closing the door behind me. Hey, Bozy, what's up? I'm dropping out of school and leaving home. Why? I'm sick of people telling me what to do. Where have you been? You smell like smoke, dude. I accidentally set the house on fire. What? I was cooking bacon and the grease caught fire. My folks will kill me. Ooh, did you call the fire department? No way. They'd arrest me for smoking pot. Well, you just let it burn? I couldn't get it out, so I just left. Well, you're something else, Bozy. I'm going south where my sister lives. You want to come along? Yeah, sure. There's nothing keeping us here. I didn't go back home to see the damage I'd done. Instead, I drove Mom's old Chevy to southern Missouri where my sister lived. We rented an old farmhouse out in the country. I got a job at a furniture factory to get some cash. This life didn't satisfy me either, so I called home. Hello? Mom, it's me. Bozy, are you still in Missouri near your sister? Yeah, I guess she told you, huh? Yes. She said you got a job in a furniture factory. Yeah. Mom, I'm sorry about the mess I made. You mean the fire? Yeah. You almost burned the house down, Bozy. I'm glad I didn't. God must have put it out. It melted the sheer curtains in the front room windows and scorched the paint off the ceiling. Is Dad mad at me? <laughs> what do you think? You think he'll let me come back home again? Maybe. But you won't be cooking in our kitchen again. Before we left southern Missouri... My friends and I picked a few pods from wild plants because we heard they gave a good buzz if they were eaten. We took the pods home with us. Wisdom is too high for a fool, and I was definitely a fool. I still had to face my dad. Your bad judgment cost us a lot of money, Bozy. I know. I said I'm sorry, Dad. You're lucky the house didn't burn down. Yeah. It was stupid of me. Yeah, well, all you had to do was put a lid on the skillet, and the fire would have gone out. Well, now I know. Mom says you want to move back home. Yeah, I'll get a job. I worked hard when I was in Missouri, even saved some money. If you move back here, I expect you to go back to school. Oh, come on, no, Dad. No, you can go to night school, but I want you to get an education. I hate school. You can't get anywhere in this world without an education. Look at me. All I can get are warehouse jobs. All right. I'll go to night school. One night, Dad dropped me off at school and went back home to wait for class to end. But I didn't stay at school. I joined my friends and we ate a whole pod of a plant that was concentrated with natural minerals, along with five tranquilizers, washing them down with beer. Dad returned to school to get me, and while he was gone, a policeman came to our door. Because of the drugs, I don't remember much of what happened, but my parents remember. Mrs. Lytle? Yes? Your son is lying in the back seat of my patrol car. He's drunk. How can that be? My husband dropped him off at school. He didn't stay there. We found him drunk and walking down the middle of Blue Ridge Boulevard. He's a big guy, but I'll, I'll try to bring him in here. 
Come on, help me, kid. I can't walk. His room is in the basement. You can take him down there. Ugh, he's really out of it. Maybe I'll just leave him here in the living room. <sighs> Bozy, what's going on? Talk to me. <laughs> he's not drunk. Yes, he is. I've seen a lot of drunks. Something else is wrong. Look at him. Maybe you're right. I'll get one of our narcotics guys out here. I told the narcotics detective what we had done, and he called me an ambulance. Meanwhile, Dad returned home and rode with me to the hospital. Dad and two or three other big guys had to hold me down in the emergency room most of the night. I didn't even know who I was for three days and would have died without the care I received. But I learned nothing. The father of a fool hath no joy, and worse would come. Shortly, we'll hear how things worsened for Del Rey. Now, though, here's Pacific Garden Mission's president, Phil Kwiatkowski. Thanks, Timothy. Many countries ban churches and the Bible is forbidden, so multitudes of people never hear the gospel, how Jesus Christ can change their lives. Radio alone can enter their homes and their lives with the truth of God's love and provision for sin. Since 1950, Pacific Garden Mission has produced Unshackled as an ambassador for Christ, the longest running radio drama in history, with new testimonies every week of how the cross of Christ brings victory over sin and death. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You can be used to share the story of God in your life through Unshackled. Write and tell us how the Lord redeemed you and your testimony could reach untold millions of people changing their lives. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Don't keep the good news to yourself. If you know of someone who has come out of darkness into the light of the world, write and tell us about that too. And our radio committee will take it from there. Here's an excerpt from a listener as to how this program has helped him. I was recently incarcerated and away from my family and stumbled upon your program. I am an avid listener now and thank God. I listen every night and it helps me feel alive. So contact us and share your story. Write to Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. My other friends who consumed the pods were found and taken to different hospitals, and we all survived. I turned 17, still doing drugs. One day my mom came home from work and found me sitting in a chair in our living room. I was completely stoned. What's this in my picture, Bozy? Marijuana? I know it's not tea leaves. It's mine. Leave it alone. <laughs> Get it, Leaf? Don't tell me to leave it alone. I don't want drugs in my house. You don't know what you're talking about. Look at these walls. Who did that? Were your friends over here? What if they were? They beat up the living room walls and I won't have it. They're my friends. What's that stuff in your shirt pocket? More marijuana? It's illegal, Bozy. Don't you get it? Illegal. Leave me alone. I'm sure glad you're home, Dale. What's going on? Bozy's friends were over here and left a trail of marijuana. Look at this pitcher full of it. And look what they did to the walls. Oh, Bozy, don't you ever learn? He's out of it and very belligerent. D answer me, Bozy. Leave me alone. I see things you don't understand. We have to get him some help. I'm calling the police. No, 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 don't do that. He'll be arrested. Being arrested is better than being dead of an overdose. <sighs> now get rid of that stuff in your shirt pocket, son. No, it's mine. I'm not afraid of the cops. When the policeman arrived, he asked me what was in my shirt pocket, and I made a smart aleck remark to him, so he arrested me and led me off in handcuffs to the jail. Dad followed us. As soon as I was booked, Dad bailed me out. Both my parents took me to court and went into the judge's chambers with me. This is not your first run-in with the law, Dell. 
No. Uh, no, sir. No, sir. This is a serious offense, young man. You'll have a police record. I can handle it, sir. Tell you what I'll do. I was a 20-year Navy man, and I saw young men like you shape up under military discipline as they learned to serve their country. If you enlist in the Navy, I'll see that you have no police record. Are you willing to do that? I guess so, sir. Well, what's the next step? There's a recruiting office in Raytown. See that he gets there tomorrow and bring me a signed copy of the enlistment. Apparently, he thought the Navy hadn't changed in the years since he was in, but it had. The next day, my mom took me to the Naval Recruiting Office where I enlisted. I already had a problem with authority, so that may not have been the wisest thing to do. I attended basic training at Great Lakes Naval Training Center near Chicago, graduated, and my whole family came to the graduation. I requested submarine duty and went to Groton, Connecticut. Three months passed. Hello? Hey, Mom. It's me. Dell, how's it going? I'm being transferred to Pensacola. Is everything okay? Yeah, but I decided right away that submarines weren't for me and asked for a transfer. My transfer finally came through. What kind of ship will you be on then? An aircraft carrier, the USS Lexington. It's an old World War II ship they used to train Navy and Marine pilots. That's exciting. Are you coming home? Uh, no time, but I'll stay in touch. Uh, say hi to Dad. Uh, gotta go. When I passed through New York on my way to Florida, I was mugged at the airport. Someone found me and took me to the hospital for treatment, but my duffel bag with all my belongings was stolen. I was able to catch my flight to Pensacola and join my ship where I became a fireman, or snipes as we were called, working in the engine room in the hole of the ship. Oh, what I wouldn't give to get high. Here, Lytle. We got some good stuff that'll do the trick. On board the ship? <laughs> where you been all your life? Yeah. That's cool, man. I've been dying to get stoned. No need to suffer, man. We can get whatever you want. Who knew? I mean, a judge sent me here to get me away from drugs. Every port has dealers and sources. When we're in port, we even go out in the pastures and pick mushrooms. The right ones give you a buzz. Yeah, and the wrong ones kill you. Our ship was a floating pharmacy full of rebellious teenagers, and I got more involved with drugs than ever before. I started shooting cocaine and doing acid, everything short of heroin. My first leave finally came, and I went home. I took some literature that I had received and showed my mom. Where did you get this material, Bozy? Some of the guys and I went to a religious meeting we heard about. Is this stuff it talks about for real? This is not of the Lord. Why not? Because it says, if you don't want this material, throw it away. If it was of God, it would say, give it to someone else. Really? Yes. Jesus told us to go and make disciples of all nations. What he actually said was, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And I haven't done a very good job of doing that. Perhaps I was seeking answers to life, but I sure wasn't finding the answers in drugs. I got high every chance I could, but because I also worked hard and tried to do the best job I could, I made E4. When I was in my last year in the Navy, I had a short timer's calendar to mark off every day until my discharge. Here's to our last couple of months of servitude. Let's go AWOL. Are you nuts? I'm tired of taking orders. Well, so am I, but I don't fancy getting the boot after all the time I put in. We won't get the boot. Oh, how do you figure? If you're gone 30 days, it's desertion. So we stay away for 29 days and it's only AWOL. You want to do it? Sure. Let's go. We hitchhiked to Missouri to party and visit with my parents, who thought we were on leave. Then we hitchhiked to southern Missouri to visit my sister and purchased a car while there. I was driving, wired on speed, approaching a way station when I must have passed out at the wheel. 
I ran the car off the road and up an embankment in front of the way station. I awoke with a start as an officer tapped on the window. What's the problem? Oh man, I must have fallen asleep. Where are you headed? Southern Missouri. My sister lives here. We're on leave from the Navy. Yeah, just visiting family. No damage done, but you better get some rest before you cause a serious accident. Yes, sir. We're almost there. I'll give you a warning ticket this time, but from now on, stay on the road. He believed our story. We returned to the naval base at the end of our 29 days, and I went before Captain's Mast, where the ship's captain is the judge. He sentenced me to three days in the brig with only bread and water and a New Testament. Since I had nothing else to do, I read the New Testament. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I didn't really know what to do about the things I read. While I was serving detention in the Pensacola Naval Base for three days, my ship went out to sea for a training mission. I missed a ship moving and had to fly to the Lexington by carrier on board delivery. Hey, where you been, Lytle? You missed the ship's movement. Yeah, so they flew me aboard on a COD. You flew in on a COD? Sure did. What an experience. I landed on the flight deck of a moving ship. Oh man, I'd love to do that. Yeah, it made three days in the brig almost worth it. Did you lose a stripe? Yeah, but who cares? I'm a short timer. Yeah, less than a month to go. I can't wait. I was anxious to use drugs again. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. My rebellious ways continued and I was busted for possession of marijuana. I went before the captain's mast once again. Fireman Lytle, you were caught with contraband, less than an ounce of marijuana. Do you have anything to say for yourself? No, sir. I'm reducing your rank from E3 to E1. And because this is your second time before me, you will be discharged from the Navy. The Navy doesn't need men like you. But because your work evaluation is good, you will receive an honorable discharge. You are dismissed. In 30 days, I would have been discharged. Instead, I was kicked out of the Navy. I went home and moved in with my parents. I got a job with a security company, but I continued my party lifestyle. Our dog would sniff at the basement door when I came home so drunk I got sick. <laughs> well, Bozy must be home again. And he was probably sick down there. Well, he can just clean it up. He complains about his stomach a lot. He might have ulcers. He's become an alcoholic and a druggie, that's what. Where did we go wrong, Dale? I don't know. He's always been headstrong. Would you check on him before you go to work? Yes. Let's talk to him about moving out. Getting his own place. I'm glad you're still alive, Bozy. Your dad and I were concerned about you. Don't worry, Mom. I can take care of myself. It wouldn't hurt to call and let us know. Sorry. Anything to eat? You know where the kitchen is. Have some cereal. Your dad and I think it's time you got your own place. Sure. I don't mind the basement, though. You need to start saving money for rent and a deposit. I will. You're 21 years old now, Bozy. I can't tell you what to do, but you're just wasting your life. How do you figure that? I served my country. I'm working full time. But you don't know the Lord. You need the Lord in your life. You don't seem to need him. I do need the Lord. Your dad and I were not raised in church, and we don't go to church often anymore. But we know that the Lord Jesus died for our sins. We just... 
don't go to church very often. I'm doing fine, Mom. I don't need anything else. You drink and party too much. You need to be saved. You know something? I don't need this lecture. Get off my back. I didn't save money because I spent it partying, but I told my folks I would move out. They offered to help me move my bedroom furniture and stayed home from work that morning. I forgot. And when I came home from work, there they were, which made me angry. We argued, and I left. I stalked out of the house, got in my car, and drove away. I had a date with a train. Next week, we'll hear about that encounter. Until then, listening friend, we'd like you to know there is no one like the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said in John chapter 10, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. The Bible declares in 1 John chapter 5, And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Invite Christ into your life anytime, anywhere, there are no special words because God sees your heart and knows when you want to turn from the sin of unbelief to Christ. If you need help in making this crucial decision, get in touch with Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. The telephone number in Chicago, 312-492-9410. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. Visit our website to learn more about this ministry, www.unshackled.org. A listener from Micronesia writes, Oh, how I enjoy your program. It actually lifts my spirits. Well, thank you. And please take a moment to thank the manager of this station for broadcasting Unshackled. This is program number 3361. Heard in the true story of Delray Lytle, part one, were Tom Taylorson, Cynthia Judge, Brad Armacost, Darren Stevens, Jamie Barron, and Martin Hallisey. Original music, Don Badorf. Sound, Nadine Aloysio Sorensen. Engineer, Kim Rasmussen. Script, Kenitha Gabler. And I'm Timothy Gregory. Unshackled is produced by Pacific Garden Mission to show through true stories that if your life is empty, it can be filled to overflowing. Please write today. Your letter means a great deal to us. The address? Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois. 60607. You may call Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago and talk with someone who cares. 312-492-9410. Someone is waiting for your call. 
How do you do? Every so often we hear about a train that hits a vehicle at a crossing. Sometimes the vehicle has stalled, or worse yet, the driver tried and failed to beat the train. Sometimes, though, the wreck is the result of distraction, like the man in this story. He'd be dead now except for someone who got his attention and saved him when his heart and mind and life were unshackled. Shining the light of the world into the darkness, this is Unshackled. True life stories dramatized and produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Homeless people may think that money would solve their problems, but riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Those who come to Pacific Garden Mission receive wealth of a different kind. Hearty meals, fresh clothing, and a safe place to sleep, even medical care in the mission clinic. Pastors and counselors share the real riches, the truth that makes them free the truth of who they are in the eyes of the only one who matters, the one who is the same yesterday and today and forever. He offers unsearchable riches. Now for broadcast around the earth, here is program number 3362 in the series, Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. I wondered if you'd come straight home from your job, Bozy. What are you and Dad doing here? You're supposed to be at work. Well, we planned to go to work late, remember? We stayed home to help you move out today. Move out? This is the day you said you'd move into your own place, son. Did you forget? I'm not ready. Oh, what do you mean you're not ready? I don't have enough money saved. You should have told us. You shouldn't jump to conclusions. I'll decide when I'm ready to move. What kind of parents are you anyway? Try to throw me out. Now, where are you going? None of your business. I'm 21, remember? I'm not a kid anymore. The man in our story allowed a bad temper and drugs to rule his life. But an encounter with a freight train would change everything. This is the conclusion of his story. The true testimony of Del Rey Lytle, right now on Unshackled. I stormed out of the house that June morning, intent on driving to a friend's house to join an ongoing party. On the north side of Main Street in Grandview, Missouri, there were four sets of railroad tracks I had to cross on the way to his house. A large train depot obscured the view of the tracks, and I didn't see the signal lights flashing. Neither did I see the freight train that struck me, going 45 miles an hour. Stand back, folks. You can't come through here. Officer, I'm a paramedic with the Life Flight Helicopter. Okay, come on through. Can I help with casualties? Now, there's only one, the driver, and we're taking him out of the vehicle right now. The car was pushed up the track. It's totaled. Is he alive? Yeah, but unconscious. I was on my way to work when I heard the crash. I can give him CPR. You're a godsend, buddy. Have you notified his family? There's an officer on the way there right now. Oh. The paramedic worked on our son until the helicopter arrived to take him to the hospital in Kansas City, which was 15 minutes from our house. When the policeman reached our home, he told us to hurry or we might not see Dell alive, so we rushed to the hospital. What's taking so long? Uh, X-rays, maybe. Other tests. Don't, don't, don't worry. At least he's still alive. I'm glad they let us see him for a minute. He didn't look as bad as I feared. Oh, oh, here comes the nurse. The doctor looked at the x-rays and there are no broken bones. Amazing. Your son has a closed head injury. What does that mean? A, a concussion? Uh, similar. Except for a cut on the top of his head and the brain swelling, he has no bleeding or other injuries. Nothing penetrated his brain, but he is in a coma. The Bible says in Job chapter 17, My days are past. My purposes are broken off, even the thoughts of my heart. And that was a description of our son as he lay in a coma week after week. 
We took turns staying by his side. Dell's left arm was folded over his chest and his left side began to atrophy, even though we moved his arms and legs. He was a big man, six feet four, and the hospital used a lift to move him in order to make the bed. We need to change the sheets, Mrs. Lytle. You hear that, Bosey? I'll be right over there. How did he get the name Bosey when he was little? He wore sleeper pajamas, and his sister thought he looked like Bozo the Clown on television. (laughs) When was he ever little? A long time ago. Okay, we definitely need a lift to move him. Uh, Careful! (gasps) Bozy, you dropped him. Get some help to pick him up. Dell was in the coma for 29 days. Then he awoke and remained at the hospital a few more days before he was moved to a rehabilitation hospital in Kansas City as an inpatient for intensive physical, speech, and occupational therapy. Your son needs extensive therapy. Because of the injury and the coma, his muscles have atrophied. We moved his arms and legs while he was unconscious. Well, that's good, but it's only part of the problem. We'll have to stretch his arm an inch at a time and then put a cast on it to hold it in that position. Uh, The pain will be excruciating. It'll take weeks to get his arm straightened out, and even then, he'll need hours of therapy before he can move his arm on his own. He's going to need a lot of help then. Uh For months, maybe years. I have to wonder why God allowed this to happen. Each week, the cast was removed so Dell's arm could be stretched an inch as much as he could stand. Then the cast was replaced. This process was repeated many times. Even when his arm was straight and the cast was no longer necessary, he needed therapy to move his arm and then only slowly. There were other problems. How's Bosey? The arm is doing a little better, but he still falls when he tries to walk without the walker or cane. Left side weakness again? Like a stroke? Yes. We've attached a brace to his left shoe, going up to his knee to hold his knees in place. Otherwise, his left leg tends to swing out and the knee bends backward when he walks. Will he ever walk normally again? It's unlikely. But someday he should be able to get around with a walker or a cane. He's still falling? Yes. Stairs will definitely be a problem. And his speech, is that getting better? Well, you'll see. He's working on that. I can understand him, but... He won't sound like his old self. He's still having trouble feeding himself? Getting there, his speech therapist said. He's right-handed. You'd think there wouldn't be a problem. His right arm has spasticity. The shaking makes it hard for him. My poor son. What else is wrong? Uh, Dell says he has double vision. Double vision? Yeah, I'm not surprised. What do you do for that? We put a patch over his left eye to strengthen his right eye and vice versa. Do you think he'll be ready to come home in a month? Well, that's what they said. He's already been there two months. But he still falls when he tries to walk without assistance. Can't stay there forever. We'll have to get the house ready for a wheelchair. There's time. I worry about him going back to drugs when he gets out. How can he when he can't get around? I asked the church if they could send someone Bosey's age to visit him at the hospital to share the gospel with him. What'd they say? They didn't have anyone. So I called another church, and they said they'd send someone, but so far they haven't. Well, we haven't been very faithful in our attendance, Donna. No. I'd like to start going again as soon as Bozy comes home. Right now is hard because we visit him on Sunday. It's always something, isn't it? There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 19, And God had a plan for us, I would learn. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. One day as I was leaving work, a young man I knew inquired about Bosey. How is Bosey doing, Donna? Better, but his speech is still a struggle, and he's not able to stand well. He's going to need outpatient therapy for a long time. Keep the faith. 
Who knew that a closed head injury had so many complications? We're praying for him at church. Thank you. I called a couple of churches and asked them to visit him. I hoped they'd share the gospel with him, but so far none of them have gone. They haven't? No. Bozy needs the Lord. We all do. Young people from my church will visit him. Bozy? Yes? We're from a church in your hometown of Grandview. I work with your mother. Oh. We heard you're going home soon. Yes. Soon. Next week. Wonderful. Praise God you survived that awful crash. Yes. We'd like to invite you to our Bible study on Monday night at church. Would you like to come? Okay. Great. If you don't have a ride, someone can get you and take you home. Dad can take me. Okay. In the meantime, remember that Jesus loves you so much he died for you. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you. Don't thank me. Thank Jesus. We'll see you Monday night, okay? We'll hear about Dell's decision shortly. Now, though, here's Pacific Garden Missions President, Phil Kwiatkowski. Thanks, Timothy. Do you ever wonder how Pacific Garden Mission helps so many people redeem their lives from hopelessness? We publish a monthly newsletter, the PGM News, that explains through articles and color pictures people and ministries we support. You can receive the PGM News completely free. Simply write and ask for your subscription. You'll find articles that detail our various ministries, like Unshackled and the Bread of Life, the Men and Women's Division, the PGM Medical Clinic, and those who care for hurting people. The PGM News is a glossy newsletter that reveals the heart of our mission our purpose of sharing the transforming power of the gospel with the compassion of Christ. Start your free subscription now. Write to us at Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. I hadn't been to church in nearly a decade, and I wasn't eager to go to Bible study but I couldn't say no to the people who made the effort to visit me in the hospital. After three months of rehabilitation, I went home with my parents. I was still using a wheelchair the night Dad took me to the Bible study. God has wonderful promises in the Bible, but he also has stern warnings. Hosea chapter 4 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Believers are priests to God. We are to worship him, serve him, glorify him. Therefore, 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Folks, read the word. The psalmist wrote, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Read God's word every day. You don't eat just once a week, do you? We're supposed to consume God's word daily. Jeremiah wrote in chapter 15, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Now, there's a true believer. Now, if you say you love the Lord and are called by his name, read his word. What did you think of the Bible study? Well, that guy is nuts. Why do you say that? Well, he said you should read the Bible every day. Who has time for that? Well, he's right. We probably should. Yeah, and, and you should go to church every week. Well, we can't go down home and go hunting and fishing. Spending time with family is important, too. Well, that's not all. He thinks a family should have devotions every day. Pray together. That wouldn't hurt. What did you think of it, Bosie? I liked it. Good. 
I want to go back. The next Monday night, Dad took me to the Bible study again. And this time, he realized the preacher really knew the Bible. I was still in a wheelchair and had a patch over one eye, looking like a pirate as I listened. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You aren't saved by what you do. You're saved by what Jesus did on the cross. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You don't change yourself. God changes you when you come to him in faith, believing that Christ died for your sins. All right, if there's anyone here who wants to receive God's gift of eternal life, raise your hand. I raised my hand. But then the preacher added that anyone who was serious should stand to their feet. I couldn't stand, so I was pretty discouraged. But the preacher had seen my hand and sent a young man who wheeled me out into the hall to explain from the Bible what God says about salvation. Do you believe you're a sinner, Bozy? Terrible. More than most. God says in Romans chapter 3, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. We're all guilty before God, and he makes the same offer to all. Come to the cross of Christ and be forgiven. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What do I do? Romans chapter 10 promises that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Is that clear? Yes. Would you like to do that? Yes. In your own words, Ask God to save you, and he will, Dell. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I prayed, asking God to save me, and he did. Later, I was carried in my wheelchair to the church baptistry for baptism, and I began growing in knowledge of the Lord as a young man discipled me. In time, I began walking with a walker. For the next year, I continued rehabilitation therapy as an outpatient. They helped me get my GED and even had a ceremony that my family, pastor, and church friends attended. That year, I moved from my parents' home to a high-rise, low-income apartment the church owned. The apartment was right next door to the church where I attended a school of ministry. That's how I met Rachel, who helped me with my homework. Let me uh, rewrite that paper, Dell. Thanks. Your writing is a lot better than mine. Oh, you do very well, considering all that you've been through. I'm getting there, but my right hand still has a mind of its own. I was wondering, Dell, why do some people call you Bosey? It was a nickname, but my therapist says it's unprofessional, and I should use my real name in ministry. She's right. I'm learning to drive again, Rachel. Oh, that's great. With God, all things are possible. I wish I had known Jesus years ago. Oh, you're right. But you can't lament the past, Dell. All you can do is live in the present. Yes. I believe God can use even me. He does. You're an inspiration, Dell. The way you never give up. He got your attention the hard way, but now all he asks is a willingness to be obedient. That's in this lesson from Isaiah, chapter 6. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. The Lord has called every believer to go out and... Preach the gospel. Yes, tell them about the Savior. And you do that all the time. 
I got my driver's license, and Rachel and I began dating. I volunteered to work in a ministry our church supported at a faith-based private prison in our county. I led a prayer group open to inmates and employees alike. I loved Rachel very much and wanted to marry her. I love you too, Del. I want to marry you, but I have nothing to offer you. You are more than enough. I'll never be able to work normally. The Lord will provide what we need, Del. Trust Him. I do, Rachel. It amazes me how He's worked in our family. My parents are going to church again, regularly, and they've rededicated their lives to Christ. My sisters are saved, too, and the oldest is serving the Lord. See? God is working His own way. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. <laughs> Good thing, huh? God really does take the broken lives, the junk that nobody wants, the worst of us, and turns it all around. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I love that verse. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Then it's settled. We'll get married in September. Rachel and I were married nine months after we met. God gave us three children, two girls and a boy. Our church had a ministry at the county detention center in Kansas City where I helped to share the love of God with young offenders. Drugs are not the answer to your problems. Jesus is the answer. I tried most every drug there is except heroin. Overdosed a couple of times. Almost died once. I wanted to control my life. Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The thief is the devil, and he wants to steal your birthright, to know God. He wants to destroy every opportunity you have to make good. I joined the Navy so I wouldn't have to go to jail, and I worked hard, but the thief lured me into drugs. And a month before my time was up, I was kicked out of the Navy. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came home and kept using drugs, and I was on my way to a party when I was hit by a train. But you know something? I'd rather be hit by a train than spend eternity in hell. I was on my way to hell, but God spared my life. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. You don't want to go to hell. <laughs> the Lord sent me to tell you He loves you. So much he sent his son to die for your sins. I taught Bible study once a week to inmates, spending quality time one-on-one -on -one with the men. Nothing compares with leading someone to Christ. Four years ago, I began experiencing a new problem. What did the doctor say? It's called brachial plexopathy. That's terrible. I know what that is. I didn't. The pain is in the neck, literally, where the nerve leaves the spinal column. What treatment do they suggest? Not much. More physical therapy. Oh, you're right-handed, Del. This is serious. I know, honey. I can hardly use my arm, and the left one is pretty useless. I won't be able to help you around the house much anymore. Oh, don't worry about it. It's depressing. Why me? Why now? I'm trying to serve God. His ways are past finding out, Del. Keep trusting him. The neurologist gave me some pain meds. I thought I was through with that. This brachial plexopathy is probably related to the train accident. Who knows? Bottom line is I'm out of the ministry for the duration. That was the lowest point in my life as my daily functions became limited. My dominant arm was partly paralyzed and I became very depressed. But gradually, the Lord restored most of the ability in my right arm and I resumed my ministry, helping at a rescue mission. I preach at the mission twice a month.
Hello? Hi, Dell. I called to say your baby sister is now a pastor's wife. Praise the Lord. It's amazing what the Lord has done in our family. Yes? She was saved because of your witness, Dell. The way you lived your life after you were saved. We are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I can tell that you're teaching the discipleship class. And I heard you're speaking at the Sunday night prayer meeting in church. Praise the Lord. We'll be there. No matter who you are or what your situation, you can serve the Lord. I send out daily devotions to nearly 200 people. As Paul wrote, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Psalm 50, verse 15 says, And call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Do you glorify God with your life? There is only one way, and that is through the cross of Christ. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, you must be born again. And you can do that now by praying with us. Dear God, I admit that I am a sinner and cannot save myself. I believe you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead and lives forevermore, able to save me now. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, and help me glorify you. Thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us know you prayed, and we'll send you some literature to help you walk in new life. The address? Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. The telephone number in Chicago, 312-492-9410. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. Visit our website to learn more about this ministry, www.unshackled.org. This is program number 3,362. Unshackled is produced by Pacific Garden Mission to show through true stories that if your life is empty, it can be filled to overflowing. Please write today. Your letter means a great deal to us. The address? Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Day or night, you may call Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago and talk with someone who cares. 312-492-9410 Someone is waiting for your call. 312-492-9410